Morning, everybody. Welcome to Duck Church. Happy Palm Sunday. I see that y'all have your palms in your hands. So as we worship this morning, we're going to wave palm branches in the air when we get to the chorus of this song, when we start to sing Hosanna, as a way of remembering the day that Jesus was uh, parading through Jerusalem as the triumphant king. So we invite you to sing with us. And when we get to the part where we start singing Hosanna, lift your palm branches high in the air. Yep, I'm seeing some kids right there. That, yep. That's exactly what you're going to do. All right, let's stand together and worship our king. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Yeah. 
Welcome to Duck Church. Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and shield. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. I think that's what we've been doing this morning already. So as we uh, gather together to prepare for the week uh, ahead, let's give the Lord the best of our worship. 
Hey, if you'll look in your, your bulletin this morning, you will find your connection card. And if you haven't already, please complete as much information as you feel comfortable in sharing. It does help us to know you a little better and how we might better serve you, pray for you, or join you in prayer for a request that you would share with us. And uh, if you're with us for the first time or maybe the second time, if you would check the appropriate box on the left side, we'd appreciate that. Well, <clears throat> on the back side are some next steps. We'll talk about those at the conclusion of the message this morning. But those are designed to help us take the things that we believe in our hearts and our minds and put them into practice in our lives. So uh, for now, hang on to that connection card and uh, we'll give you time a little later in the service and we'll collect them um, toward the end of the service. Uh, we'll give you time to finish up anything that you need to. Um, so this morning we're going to be looking at Mark's gospel and we'll be looking at chapter 15 verses 21 through 41 and the message is the way of the cross. Uh, in my recent reading I was reading uh, something from Tim Keller something that he uh, wrote about Jesus and this is what he said. We must say to ourselves something like this. Well, when Jesus looked down from the cross, he didn't think I am giving myself to you because you are so attractive to me. No, he was in agony. And he looked down at us, denying him, abandoning him, and betraying him. And in the greatest act of love in history, he stayed. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. He loved us, not because we were lovely to him, but to make us lovely. Everyone is welcome here in the Duck Church family where today we gather to give thanks to God for the sacrifice of Jesus. So um, as we uh, come together for our, uh, we're going to do this uh, different order here. We come together for our prayer and then we'll get to the mission moment. Um, we want to lift up in prayer our organist and choir director, Deb Benton, who is not feeling well, and uh, we pray for uh, God to bring healing to her. Um, also, we want to pray for Alex and Ingrid, and we want to pray for all of those who are dealing with cancer, and in particular, one uh, person named Johnny was uh, mentioned in the earlier services that we want to be in prayer for or the others that we would add to our list this morning. Anybody else? Yes? Bots and family. Okay. Yes? Bev, Chris, and Eli. Bev, Chris, and Eli. Yes? Al, Luke, and Kelly. Cheyenne and new granddaughter, Isla Rose. Yay! Cheyenne and Isla Rose, new grandbaby. Congratulations. Yes? Mike Farr. Yep. My brother-in-law, Mike Farr. And my sister, Janice. Anybody? Yep. Oh. Wonderful. Thank you for that update. Yep, John. Gail Harris. Gail Harris, thank you. Yep. Ann, Carol, and Vicky. Ann, Carol, and Vicky. Jason. Yes. For Shane and his mom. Okay. Shane and his mom. Yes. Healing for the Roland family. All right. Oh, David.
Thank you, David. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice to, be know, uh, to know that we are loved by you and we are loved by God, aren't we? Every one of us. Thank you, David. All right. All right. Yes. Chris and Carla. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Yes? Oh, yes. The concert goers that were killed in Russia. All those grieving families. All right. Let's pray together. Fathers, we come before you this day, a day we observe as the first day of Holy Week. We give you our thanks and our praise. We thank you that Jesus chose to make his entrance into Jerusalem as he did, knowing full well that a cross was in his immediate future. We thank you that Jesus put aside his fears and, and laid down his life for each of us so that through his death and resurrection, we might be offered the gift of eternal life. We thank you for this and so many other blessings that fill our lives. And we gather together today to lift to you all of those who seek to cope with changing situations. There are those who are grieving the death of a loved one. There are those who are in declining health. Those who seek your wisdom and guidance. And those who desire to know you more fully and walk with you every day of their lives. Please grant your peace to each one and help them maintain a healthy perspective as they negotiate the challenges before them. And Father, please guide this congregation to be a unique and meaningful presence in our community, offering the hope and the love that we've found in Jesus. We offer this prayer in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so our mission moment this morning is highlighting Vacation Bible School, which is going to be here before we know it. Uh, in fact, uh, it will be held on June, hang on, I wrote it somewhere, June the 7th through 17th through the 20th from 9 until noon each day. So let's give our attention to the screens for just a moment to see what's coming up. Another hot one out there. Temps reaching over 100 degrees today. Hope you're keeping cool and having fun on this hot summer day. Now, let's get back to... So uh, it is not too early to begin uh, praying about uh, the children that will be impacted by this week and the leaders that will 
uh, lead. We want to be able to present the gospel in a clear way that's easy for our children to understand because we're trying to make disciples who worship passionately, who love extravagantly, and who witness boldly. And so this gives us an opportunity to have that time with children during that week. And if you've got kids, if you've got grandkids, uh, please bring them. Uh, and speaking of that, I uh, hope you know that we've got an Easter egg hunt right after worship today uh, down in the fellowship hall. So you're invited to stay for that. And there'll be a little lunch there as well. So uh, maybe you came and uh, you didn't know that this was going on. You still are welcome to come. We, we have prepared enough for everybody. So we hope you'll be a part of it. All right, as we turn our attention now to God's Word and specifically Mark's Gospel, I, I want to say that I believe with all my heart that this is the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. And today, as we look at the passion of the Christ, let's be attentive as God's Word is read so that we can discover what God has in store for us this morning. Would you pray with me? Holy God, Word made flesh, let us come to this Word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment. Confound our expectations, clear the cobwebs from our ears, Penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can, and we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. In Jesus' name, amen. In the first century, Rome executed criminals by crucifixion. It was intended to be a humiliating an agonizing experience. There was no concept of death with dignity for the guilty. According to Roman antiquities, after a man was sentenced to die, he was stripped of his clothes and paraded through the streets of the city so that his punishment could be seen by all. He was required to carry a 50 pound cross piece upon his back or sometimes the entire cross which would weigh about 200 pounds. And as he stumbled toward his execution, the soldiers would follow closely behind, whipping him all the way. When they arrived at the place of the execution, the criminal would both be nailed and tied with ropes to the cross beam and then would be lifted onto the cross. Now, one minor inaccuracy that we see in films and paintings of the crucifixion scene is that the cross didn't tower high above the crowd. Part of the point of the crucifixion was that the criminal should experience the torment of dangling just above the ground, and his tormentors could easily look at him in his face. The position in which the condemned man hung on the cross made it difficult for him to exhale, and this is why his legs were bent and his feet nailed near the base of the cross so that he could push up his torso a few inches to gasp for breath until the pain in his legs became unbearable and he collapsed again. And this would be repeated numerous times. The process was intended to be slow and agonizing. Sometimes the one crucified died of shock or dehydration, but most often it was because he lost his ability to support his weight and therefore suffocated. However, it didn't happen quickly. It was not uncommon for death by crucifixion to take as many as two days. And whenever the authorities decided for whatever reason to expedite the criminal's death, his legs would be broken so that he could no longer push himself up to breathe and would suffocate in a matter of minutes. Throughout the history of the Roman Empire, untold thousands were executed in this fashion. As enlightened as their society might have been in many ways, they certainly didn't place much value on human life, especially the life of one obscure Jewish peasant from Galilee. 
after Pilate sentenced Jesus to die, he turned him over to the soldiers whose job it was to lead him to his execution. And the soldiers mocked Jesus with words such as, Hail, King of the Jews. And they beat him and they spit on him and they jammed a, a crown of thorns down on his head. And we read in verse 20, When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Today I want us to look at three spiritual truths that are found in the story of Christ's crucifixion. Three lessons for meditation that will help us to experience Jesus' healing presence in our lives. First of all, Jesus couldn't carry his own cross. Since Mosaic law required that executions be made outside the city, the Romans accommodated this custom and criminals were put to death on a hill outside of Jerusalem. Roman custom was to position places of execution near well-traveled roads so that people could easily see what became of those who opposed Caesar. And it was now time for Jesus to begin uh, the journey to his death. Jesus had already endured great physical punishment up to this point, the scourging with the Roman whip. So it is not surprising that he was physically unable to carry his cross. So we read in verse 21. A man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the country just then. And they forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Now, Cyrene was a Greek settlement on the North African coast on the Mediterranean in what is now modern-day Libya. It had a large Jewish population, and since Simon is a common Jewish name, he had probably come to Jerusalem as a pilgrim in order to celebrate the Passover. The Bible says he was just a passerby when he was recruited by the Roman soldiers to carry Jesus' cross for him. Most likely, he was forced to do this against his will, and Roman soldiers certainly had the authority to demand such things, and since he was of able body, he could not refuse. And Mark includes an additional detail about this man at the end of this verse. Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Since Mark believed his early readers would know who Alexander and Rufus are, most probably they were believers who were active in the church in Rome where Mark wrote his gospel. The Apostle Paul, interestingly enough, also mentions a Roman Christian named Rufus in, in uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 13, and it very well could be the same person that Mark refers to here. When this man... Simon of Cyrene was pulled out of the crowd and compelled to carry the cross of a convicted criminal. Maybe he saw something in Jesus that caused him to want to know more about him. And ultimately, he became a follower. So Jesus couldn't carry his own cross. And so this unknown man, a man like you and me, had to carry it for him. And this is ironic because one of the most important lessons of the crucifixion is this, that even though Jesus couldn't carry his own cross, he is the only one that can help you carry yours. Do you know what it is to have more on your shoulders than you could ever possibly bear? Do you know what it is to feel absolutely helpless, absolutely powerless? Jesus does. Through most of the passion story, we see Jesus standing strong and bold and courageous in the face of the worst kind of abuse. And now, with the end so near, his body just completely gives out. He cannot take another step in his own strength. When you come to the place in your life where you cannot take another step in your own strength, I want you to know that Jesus has been there too. Remember the verse from Hebrews 4.15. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses 
For he faced all the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. I want you to know, and more importantly, God wants you to know that whatever the burden you have to bear in life, whether it's illness or weakness, trials, temptation, mistreatments, whatever it may be, you don't have to bear it alone. Jesus will help you carry your burden. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus spoke these words in Matthew 11. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke fits perfectly, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus came into this world to identify with the human race, to experience all that we experience, the same challenges, the same temptations, the same desperation. He understands you. He knows what it's like to not be able to go on, and he will be there to give you strength in your time of need. The second lesson in the crucifixion story is that Jesus could not save himself. Verse 22 and 3. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means Skull Hill. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Now there's some scholarly speculation about what the wine drugged with myrrh was intended to do. It might have been a drug intended to dull his pain. It might have equally been a a poison intended to expedite his death. We don't know. But either way, Jesus didn't accept the offer. He had been destined to drink the cup of his sacrificial death, and he intended to remain fully conscious until the bitter end. We pick up with verse 24. Then they nailed him to the cross. They gambled for his clothes, throwing dice to decide who would get them. It was nine o'clock in the morning when the crucifixion took place. A signboard was fastened to the cross above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. Two criminals were crucified with him, their crosses on either side of his. And the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha, look at you now, they yelled at him. You can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, can you? Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. In first century Jerusalem, there were those who considered crucifixions to be a form of entertainment. When a man was condemned to die, they would follow the procession out of town to the hill called Golgotha and entertain themselves at the dying man's expense. As Jesus hung on the cross, stripped, beaten, and bloody, he must have been an easy target for such ridicule. They taunt Jesus as the one who supposedly claimed he could destroy and rebuild the temple in three days. Watching Jesus die helpless and alone must have made his his claim seem laughable. And some of the leading priests were also there saying, let this Messiah come down off the cross so that we can see it and believe in him. And of course, we know now that Jesus could have done exactly that. He could have saved himself. In fact, he could have prevented himself from being there in the first place. Jesus was there not because he was the victim of circumstances beyond his control, but because he chose to lay down his life for the sake of the world. Earlier, Jesus had said to his disciples, as recorded in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, I am the good shepherd, The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I lay down my life 
that I may have it back again. No one can take my life from me. I lay down my life voluntarily, for I have the right to lay it down when I want to and also the power to take it again. And as Jesus was arrested, he said to his disciples, don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? So in that sense, Jesus could not save himself. But there's another sense in which Jesus couldn't save himself. And this is another important lesson in the crucifixion. Jesus could not save himself because he wanted to save you. Saving you, forgiving your sins and giving you eternal life meant that Jesus had to die on the cross to pay the price for your sins and he was willing to do it. He was willing to die so that you could live. He was willing to die so that you and everyone who chooses to believe in him could be reconciled to God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, all this newness of life is from God who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. For God made Christ, who, had, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Jesus died on the cross because that's what it took to bring about our reconciliation. And that was a price that Jesus was willing to pay. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had prayed, if it is possible, take this cup from me. But it wasn't possible. Jesus had to go to the cross. So in spite of all the power available to Jesus, he couldn't save himself because he wanted to save you. You see, it wasn't the nails that bound Jesus to the tree. It was his love for you that held him there. And then there's a third lesson in the crucifixion that I want us to consider. Jesus experienced separation from God. We pick up the story in verse 33. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at that time, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the most difficult part of the story to tell. It's also the part, if you ever saw Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, it's a part that couldn't be captured on film. We saw Christ's anguish in the garden, the injustice he suffered at the hands of Pontius Pilate, the mistreatment he endured from the Roman soldiers, and all of these scenes were heartbreaking, but this scene is beyond our ability to understand. At this precise moment, the Son of God's own Father abandons him. Because at this precise moment, the words spoken in Isaiah have become true. The Lord laid on him the guilt and sins of us all. As I read earlier from Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made with, right with God through Christ. In that one horrifying moment, Jesus experienced separation from God so that you can experience reconciliation with God. Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? so that you will never have to cry those words. And here is the heart of the gospel, the reason for it all. We can be reconciled to God. We can be made right in a relationship with him. We can be forgiven of our sins and receive everlasting life through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of Paul in Romans 3. 
But now God has shown us a different way of being right in his sight. Not by obeying the law by the way promised in the scriptures long ago. We are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in the same way, no matter who we are or what we have done. A comment that I've heard from many who saw the Passion of the Christ movie is that it gives a person a a greater understanding of what Christ has done for us. And that is true. The movie tells us what Christ did, but it doesn't really tell us why. It depicts Jesus' suffering, but it doesn't explain them. And I doubt any movie could, but the Bible can. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, he personally carried away our sins in his own body on the cross so we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. You have been healed by his wounds. Peter here is quoting a verse from the prophet Isaiah. And if you saw the passion of the Christ, you probably remember that this verse appears on the screen as the movie begins. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus suffering and death is our healing and salvation. Through his wounds we can experience the healing of our wounds. And so I encourage you to meditate on the passion of Christ this holy week. Remember the garden. Jesus was all alone in his agony, but you are not alone in yours. When you face your Gethsemane, Jesus is there with you. And through praying a Gethsemane kind of prayer, you will experience power over temptation. Remember Jesus' trial. He was declared guilty of crimes he did not commit and received a death sentence that he did not deserve. But Jesus endured man's injustice so that you do not have to face God's justice toward your sin. You can instead experience God's mercy. And remember Jesus' crucifixion. He could not save himself because he wanted to save you. Jesus experienced separation from God so that you can experience reconciliation to God. And moments before Jesus died, he cried, it is finished. And then Jesus said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And friends, even though his work is finished on the cross, Jesus' work is not finished in you. Jesus wants you to experience the fullness of a relationship with him. He wants you to come alive with his life inside of you. Jesus wants you to experience the power of his resurrection. And that is why Jesus gave his life for you. Let's pray together. Father, my prayer for each of us this holy week is that the weight, the immensity of this sacrificial love for us would be driven home. That we would recognize the depth and the breadth of God's love for us. That Jesus, you would suffer so much shame, so much pain, so much separation and a horrible, agonizing death, not for anything you had done, but for everything we've done. Thank you, God, for loving us in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. In response to God's magnificent love for all of us, we're 
I'm going to worship him now by giving the offering this morning. So I'd like for everyone to get your connection card back out and consider your next step this week. And I want to lift up a few things to you. Um, there are two special services during Holy Week that we will observe. Monday, Thursday, which is a commemoration of the Last Supper that Jesus had, had with his disciples, uh, on, of course, on Thursday. And then on Friday, the Good Friday service, both of those services being at 7.30. On Good Friday, we will uh, uh, participate in a tenebrae service, which is a, a service of, of all of the scriptures leading up to uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. Candles will be snuffed out after each reading, and it is a very solemn service in which we will all depart in silence. Um, so I invite you to come and be a part of those as you can Thursday night at 7.30, Friday night at 7.30. And then we have a special called session of the annual conference that's coming up on the 12th and 13th of next month. The purpose of this uh, called annual conference is to elect delegates for our first general conference, which will be held in Costa Rica in September of this year. Uh, also, uh, for those of you who have been considering making official your uh, home here at Duck Church. The next new members class will be held on Sunday, April the 21st at 3.30. Uh, please sign up for that so that we can make sure we have materials uh, enough for everyone. Jesus, Jesus gave himself for the life of the world. So with humble hearts, being in awe of all that God has done for us through Christ, let us present ourselves and our gifts to him as we worship him now. The question was raised as my conscience fell, a silly little lie. It didn't mean much, but it lingers still in the corners of my mind still you call me to walk on the edge of this world to spread my dreams and fly but the future's so far my heart is so frail think i'd rather stay inside but you love me anyway it's like nothing in life that I've ever known. Yes, you love me anyway. Oh, Lord, how you love me, how you love me. It took more than my strength to simply be still, to seek but never find. The reasons we change, the reasons I doubt, the one who loved once have to die. But you love me anyway. It's like nothing in life that I Yeah. 
stand together. Be sure to come back next Sunday as we celebrate the Lord's resurrection, Easter Sunday. Also, we're going to be having the flowering cross up on the deck. You know, normally it's out by the road. It's difficult to get out there. Sometimes it's 
soggy. Anyway, we're going to have it on the deck. So uh, if you've got flowers growing in your yard, if you want to go purchase flowers, we'll have some here, but we want to adorn the cross so that it is a wonderful testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Easter week. Uh, so please remember to bring those next week. Um, we're going to be dipping into Mark's gospel again next week. We're going to be in chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. And the message is the significance of the stone. I hope that you'll be here. And don't forget to follow through on uh, the invitations that you've been praying about to invite your friends and neighbors to worship next Sunday. And now let's receive this blessing. May the blessing of God who overcomes evil, bears our pain, and lives in us forever fill you with his grace and peace this day and always. Amen.